This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, Episode 9. At the time, you know, I was up hundreds of percents on those, and I still was holding, like, thinking it was going to go, you know, to the moon, until I took some of Clay's courses. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, who is scared of girls until college, Clay Trader. Sweaty palms, sweat rolling down my face, butterflies, me shaking back and forth. You may think I'm talking about trading right now. No, I'm talking about the feeling I got whenever a girl would even walk up to me and not even say anything. Yes, I was deathly afraid of girls until eh, pretty much still I'm scared of girls for the most part. But yeah, one of those things where I'm a, I'm a very shy person uh, by nature. And then you throw females into the equation and uh, that amplifies things quite a bit. Uh, now I just laugh at it. I'm married. I have two daughters, so there's quite a bit of irony in that too. So I live with a bunch of girls who I was scared with, scared of growing up, uh, but I've had to overcome those fears when I'm in a, a house full of the very thing that I was uh, that caused all those beads of sweat. So it is what it is, but it's pretty funny, and I just didn't have the skills that my main man Chez had back in the day. Uh, you know, I've just been a smooth talking pimp since I was, you know, straight out of the womb, pretty much. But uh, no, I'm, I had to have my microphone muted there because I was just absolutely cracking up about how you kind of explained that and the irony of, you know, you now live in a house with uh, with three girls. But yeah, I was actually shy for a, a very long time. I was an only child, so you know, the only interactions I had was kind of you know at school and stuff like that. But uh, it probably took me until I was in high school to kind of break out of that shell, and then uh, yeah, I pretty much met. My girlfriend, um, uh, when I was very, very young, like 12 years old, and we kept in touch and stuff. But uh, yeah, we've been dating for like seven years now, so I haven't had to worry about, you know, going back into the, the dating field. So yeah, I kind of, you know, similar story to you. I, I took care of that early, found one, uh, one that I liked, and now I don't have to, to worry about having you know, sweaty palms and being super nervous. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like I'm back in the game, though, trying to find a, a female to get on the podcast here. <laughs> um, for any female listeners out there, I, I swear Chez and I, uh, th there's no ulterior motives here. We are trying our best to, to get a, a lady on the show. So, but I just keep getting rejected. So I'm having a bunch of flashbacks to like middle school and high school. Everybody keeps saying, no, I'm going to have to pass. So, uh, it's kind of like a reverse midlife crisis. I think I'm going through right now. But, um, so if, if you're a female and you'd like to, uh, to be on the show, uh, in all seriousness, uh, yeah. Send us a, a message through the site, and uh, you know we'll try to work something out. But anyways, at, let, let's get past my uh, female problems here and uh, move into today's guest. Today we are interviewing Nate Wilson, and Nate uh, goes by the name Nate Wilson in the chat room, so there's no alias here. Uh, but he has uh, – the one thing I remember about Nate is uh, there's a lot of people out there, uh, more so on the penny stock world. You know, they I do video charts that explain just are very neutral – and if their stock goes down, they blame me. They say, oh, it's Clay Trader in his video chart. He must be shorting the stock, which is just, uh, you know, tinfoil hats. You know, they don't want to face the facts that, yeah, maybe they didn't make a good trade. But anyways, so they're always blaming me. And a while ago, we ran a, like just a competition, that a free giveaway. And in order to increase your wins of uh, or increase your chances of winning the giveaway, uh, you could, you know, share some links. So uh, Nate went out there and uh, his little kind of marketing gimmick was <laughs> has has clay trader shorted your pot or your penny stock you know get back at him you know take revenge and make him buy you something for free something of that nature and uh, I think he did pretty well in terms of uh, you know getting people to share that link and stuff but it was uh, it was a funny little uh, thing that was just oh that's actually pretty smart trying to uh, uh, turn people that were already against me and in, in his favor so he took a different angle on that little competition. Uh, he didn't win it still, but actually he did win it. I just chose somebody else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, and I got to note, we're all on a webcam right now, and Nate has uh, just a spectacular view. I don't know if anybody's going to really be able to beat it, unless maybe they're on the beaches of Hawaii or something. But uh, Nate, uh, why don't you... Tell us just a, a brief little overview of, of what allows you to have this nice view. 
Yes, so I'm coming to you guys live from Oreo Park at Camden Yards in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I work for an investment banking company that uh, specializes in buying and selling sports teams. And we have office space in the warehouse that is right next to the ballpark. So I have an office with a nice window that looks right into the field. And so he is not lying. I'm literally looking at it right now, and I can see – I think I can see some of the infield, or maybe that's – some. Uh, yeah, I think that's the infield I can see. But, yeah, it's a great view, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty jealous. Uh, and Nate's a good guy. He's, uh, he's promised to get uh, some tickets if I come out to Baltimore so I can go see an Orioles game. Um, so – and actually, he was flashing those before the game, so I think he's already got them. So I'm, yeah, I'm pretty... so I already went out and got them for you, so now you just have to show up. All right, man. He's calling me out on the <laughs> podcast. I like this. I like the way you roll here. All right, well, let's, uh, let's hop into the story here. I have, uh, we were all talking quite a bit before we even started recording, and I think this uh, podcast could get a little wild, so I- I'm looking forward to it. But, Nate, let's just start right at the get-go. Uh, you know, what were you doing? What drew your attention to the market? And you know, what kind of got you to uh, you know, take the plunge? Yeah, so uh, the way I entered the market is uh, a little bit interesting, and I probably, uh, I don't even know if this sh- I should share this publicly, but I will anyway. Um, but so I, I graduated from college, and I came over to Baltimore to uh, work with my current company. And while, like, within the first couple months of being there, I had no experience in the market, but... Um, my boss is really good friends with the guy who started Under Armour, Kevin Plank. And so at the time, right a few months into the job, he got an offer to participate in the uh, friends and family plan for the Under Armour IPO. And so uh, my boss comes in one time and like, I, I forget how many shares he was allotted in that, in that friends and family thing, but it was, you know, it was thousands or whatever enough where he wasn't willing to buy them all so he he came around the office and kind of did a a tally of like well how many do you want how many do you want and i was like i i you know i don't know what you're talking about and so then they sat me down and were like listen so here's the deal and so uh so anyway i got allotted some shares and then you know signed up for a td ameritrade account so they could get put in there and and that was my uh initial entry into the market and uh you know, of course, obviously that was a winner right off the bat. So I'm like sitting there thinking, oh, my God, this is like instant free money. Let's, how can I do this again? And that, so that was how I got started. Now, that, was that in like 2006? What year was that? Yeah, that was right around 2005, 2006. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, I was just looking at the monthly chart and that was like a six, you know, it opened at like six bucks or eight bucks. And, you know, now it's in the 60s and it's in the 80s actually right now at this moment. So, yeah, that's pretty awesome. And, you know, yeah, and they've uh, split that. So I think it I think it's gone to 100 twice and they've split it and now it's back up into the 80s. So yeah, it's been a, a it's a been yeah. a fantastic run there. And I yeah. did, I I don't have any of those left, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, so that's actually a really cool kind of intro to the market. Did uh, so? Did that kind of spark spark your interest to kind of investigate further? You know, you know, having that that immediate winner right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. So then, so then, like after that, I kind of um, you know started to sit down with uh, the vice president. You know, is is him and I became good friends and. Uh, he always has been in investing and he kind of was sitting there and he would tell me kind of the deal like, OK, here's how it works. You know, here's what you want to do. So then since then, I've kind of I kind of branched out on my own and started taking figuring stuff out on my own, you know, went the whole because uh, we we value assets like on a fundamental basis. So I went the whole like uh, watch Jim Cramer, Mad Money and, and do like P.E. ratios and fundamental stuff for a long time. All right, I got a, a question. You said you sat down with uh, your, your, the vice president, your, yeah. your friend, and then you said, you know, he, he told me, here's how it works. Here's what you do. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> what, could you, I'm curious, what was his definition of, you know, here's how it works, and then you do, you, here's what you do. Define okay. do. Yeah, do. So, so in, in his world and uh, the world that we kind of work in outside of the stock market, it's um you know we kind of look at the fundamentals of the financials you know un- of the underlying company and so he would go through and say all right here's what you want to look at here's how you calculate you know PE ratios and here's how you 
you know, kind of go that route. And here's how you can see if this company is either, you know, overvalued or undervalued compared to its peers. And so you could kind of try to manipulate the uh, market in that way where you would buy undervalued companies. And, and then, then this is where, you know, not knowing anything else, then you just hope they kind of either get back to the, the mean. I don't even know at that point what I was hoping for. Just that, you know, I would pick one and it would go up. But it was all based on, you know, financials and worried about how much money they were making and stuff like that. Whereas it wasn't really until I came across you, Clay, uh, about a year ago, this time, you know, last April, that I even knew what a can I didn't even know what a candlestick chart was. I mean, I knew that my uh, my broker had like a line on a chart that kind of would go up if your stock price was going up, but I didn't know what a candlestick chart was until you started posting those videos on uh, on uh, Twitter. So uh, did did you put on any more trades now based on this kind of recommendation to you know find undervalued companies? Did you did you oh, take yeah, anything yeah. on? Yeah, yeah. So I've I traded that way for you know whatever it was uh, 2005 ish and uh, all the way up until like. Uh, you know, till April of last year, 2014. And um, I actually have, have done well um, in that way. Um, some of my biggest home runs besides the Under Armour thing, I've, I've bought in and out of that tons of times. But uh, back when everything crashed, I got heavily invested into um, mortgage insurance companies. Um, and they were all trading for like low dollar figures. And um, so like, you know, I and I had gone through the process of buying a home. I knew what mortgage insurance was and I knew the rules were starting to change um as far as requiring more people to have that because of the crisis. So I kind of went all in with mortgage insurance companies and um it's funny because at the time, you know, I was up hundreds of percents on those and I still was holding like thinking it was going to go, you know, to the moon until I took some of Clay's courses and he was like, walk in and tell him you can get, you know, 10% in a couple of months. And I was like, oh, you know, I should probably clean out some of those that are up like over 300% because this is, this is ridiculous. So you did lock in profits then. you're not going to, you're not one of these stories where you're up huge and then you ended up selling for a loss. Yeah, no, thank, thankfully they all kept, they were way above where I got in and I was able to, yeah, trim some off. Very nice, very nice. Well, not to uh, kind of spoil your story, but I, I know you did some penny stocks. So yes. where went? How, how did you end up in the wild, wild west? Uh, so the penny stock thing. So that was like around January of, uh, or right, I don't know, maybe December, January of yeah, right around the thirteen, fourteen rollover, and I, right around like the Wolf of Wall Street had come out, um, and that, uh, and then. Um, I knew, yeah, marijuana was on the ballot to kind of get, uh, you know, for the vote or, or was going to, had been voted in. And I guess on January 1st, it was going to go, um, it was going to actually take effect. And so just because of, you know, I was always looking to find something that was, you know, undervalued or something. That's what led me to, oh man, I need to find some, some marijuana stock out there, which then I like was Googling, I don't know. And that's what led me to these penny stocks. And the first one I bought was uh, obviously PHOT that, you know, whatever they sold, like grow equipment or something. And so, yeah, I went in and bought, you know, whatever. I don't, it was only a couple thousand dollars worth. It was like 3000 bucks. I think that got me at the time, like some absurd number of shares, like 25,000 shares or 50,000. I don't even remember. And at, before that, you know, that most I'd ever could afford was like a couple thousand. So I'm like thinking, yeah, this this is going to be awesome. You know, when it when it starts going up like the others, this is going to be crazy. And it did. I was in really early on that um, PHOT, but that's where my, uh, you know, one of those mistakes comes in where I'm like everybody else, where that one I wrote it up like to like, I don't know, 80 cents or something I bought in, you know, for pennies or maybe not even a penny. And then it got halted and sent to the gray list, and I'm still holding all of it. You know, I never took any profit. And, uh, but luckily, when it opened back up, it was like at 20 cents. So I still was up, you know, whatever, 100%. Or, you know, I can't even remember. And I just dumped it all that day. It opened back up. And I was just thankful that it didn't open up underneath. But so that's what kind of first got me in. And then I did get big into like all those big, you know, mine and, 
and SPLI and Vapor, what all those crap. And I was in all of them just because they all kept going up after I bought them. Now, your logic here, were you, did you consider yourself an investor? Were you trying to do what your, uh, you know, your vice president friend had told you to do? Were you running fundamentals and PEs and all that sort of stuff? Or did you understand the game of, look, I'm just playing the hype? I mean, what, what yeah, did you so, think you were doing? Yeah. So, like, at first, I thought I was investing. And so, but then I would actually, you know, go in and read like the, you know, 8Ks and the 10Ks and stuff that they were actually supposedly releasing. And since I, I read those for real businesses, I was like, oh my God, this is hogwash. Like, these guys aren't, aren't real. This is all a scam, you know? And that's when I knew, like, all right, this is a total scam. Like, don't stick around for forever. Like, if it goes up, great. I just didn't really have a, a good grasp on what, what, what should be considered a lot. I mean, I know that sounds stupid, but it's like when they, you know, your first couple home, hits are all home runs and they're all, you know, these huge percentage numbers. It just, you just think it's going to happen easier than it does. Um, and I, I guess I learned my biggest lesson was uh, during the mine, the mine craze where I was in like, literally 2 million some shares under like anywhere between like just under a half a penny and like like I think the the most I ever spent for those shares was like three quarters of a penny or something and I remember riding it all the way up to like four cents and thinking yeah we're we're you know we're going to the moon with this one and it was and then rode it all the way back down and then all the way back up and then it was starting to come back down and that's when I took Clay's uh, penny stock survival guide and i remember like i finally got through like halfway through the videos like on a sunday night and was like oh my god i have to sell everything on monday <laughs> liquidate <laughs> so, all positions close them all <laughs> yeah so i i ended up closing everything at like two cents and now it's like back you know below where i bought it so i got lucky in that sense i, I did get lucky through the pot stock stuff so i didn't take any huge huge losses but um, I probably didn't make everything I could have made, but I made enough where I'm fine with it. So there was a, so you have never had a kind of blowout, no liquidity to get out type of no. penny trade. No, not in the penny trade. And like I said, there, like I only really traded like, uh, I don't know, like five or six pennies at the most total. I, and gotcha. I could probably ramble. And I mean, off. you were you were in the names that were moving too, so that, yeah, that kind of yeah. makes sense. So, so I didn't get stuck. Well, that's yeah. that's first off amazing because most people we hear that they lose their entire retirement account in you know some speculation penny stock that they buy. So kudos to you first off for you know realizing and you know after you took the course you know closing those positions. So so you kind of it's very cool to kind of hear somebody who actually reads those eight Ks and ten Ks and has an understanding of it, and you kind of were able to recognize that they're all <laughs> scams because for for a majority of them they are. Now, so you, you kind of realized that penny stocks were not a place you wanted to hang around. Where, uh, where did that bring you next? Yeah, so, and so I guess where that brought me was, uh, yeah, to Clay's videos on Twitter was like, right, I, I'd just gotten on Twitter. I don't even know how I ended up on Twitter, but like somehow Twitter became like this stock market thing for me where I was on there just looking at like sports stories and stock tickers. I don't even know how, and that's what led me to Clay. And at night, I would like watch like like the Daily Mind video that he would put out, and just you know, kind of look at the. He would talk about supports and resistance. I really, you know, as far as I was concerned, you know, I was all about the fundamentals, and he was talking like voodoo magic, you know, that you know technicals or whatever. I I had no idea what he was talking about, but the more I watched it, like the more it seemed to work, and I just was kind of intrigued. So that like led me to. Um, I actually went out and bought a book about, you know, uh, technical analysis. And I actually read that book first. And then once I read the book, I kind of was like, hey, maybe that guy Clay does know what he's talking about. So then I kind of circled back to him. And that's when I bought, like, uh, I, I went in for the uh, Inner Circle subscription and then got Robotic Training and uh, Penny Stock Survival Guide all at the same time because I was like, ah, I think he knows what he's talking about. And, uh, and so then, and then after after getting robotic trading, I was just kind of hooked that I actually liked it more than the fundamental side, and I thought it worked better. Now, and given that you given that you have experience on the fundamental side, I mean, would you agree that the whole technical analysis approach compared to fundamental analysis? Uh, how, what is your time like? Do you spend more time reading yeah. through a bunch of eight? 
Look, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've completely, as far as stocks go, I completely abandoned the fund all fundamental belief in anything having to do with them. Um, but from a from a time perspective, do you do you spend less or do you have more time free available because you don't have to go around and you know dig through all these fancy filings and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I I waste a lot less time, uh, you know, like yeah, researching stock trades and like uh, what companies I think are actually you know outperforming where their share price is currently sitting. So yeah, it's a lot a lot more free time, and I actually it's I've actually been a lot um, more successful. Um, you know, over the short term, I would say long term, you know, back in the day, over the long term, I was very successful the other way. But but short term trades, this is is proves to be a lot better. There's a lot like a lot less hold times. Um, and now, you know, like starting in October, I even opened a, a day trading account. Um, and so I've only actually been day trading, I would say, since October. So before that, it was mainly yeah. so you went from penny stocks and then what? What did you do after penny stocks? Were you well? Uh, and then I was. Uh, I was actually so that that time um, like was pretty much the summer. I was taking all of your courses, uh, and I was just learning. I wasn't really. Um, I had stopped buying stuff, and I kind of was like, okay, I want to focus on trying to learn, you know, this new style. And uh, so I still have had my TD Ameritrade, you know, stock account, and so I was like looking at charts as I would go. And I still have, you know, um, stocks in there from my my fundamental days. But I kind of stopped buying buying things, you know. And I kind of was was just watching, and I was learning. I was taking lots of courses, um, you know, trampoline and shorting and all that stuff, um, and was part of CTU. And so it wasn't until October that I felt comfortable in um, understanding the technicals enough to open the uh, day trading account. And uh, actually start buying and selling on a on a daily basis. So I want our listeners to really kind of think about what was just said here. He he focused on his education and he didn't just start buying, you know, while he's going through the stuff. He really wanted to make sure he absorbed it and he didn't feel comfortable, you know, for, for quite a few months and then he kind of started applying it. Now, did you start applying it with kind of smaller amounts at first or did you just hit it kind of full blast? Yeah, so I I guess that's where I I messed up in the sense of that's a good question. But as soon as I opened that um, account in October, and um, yeah, it, and it was you know enough to trade with on a day trading. So I went in and I was buying you know thousands of shares of Facebook at a time, you know, and and so that's where at the beginning I just was not knowing it. I was just going you know in way too big, and and um, and I would make and I would make you know, a good amount of money when I got it right and I would lose a decent, and I, I set my stop losses. I had, you know, a plan in place. So it wasn't like I was just out there, uh, shooting. I think I just, my, my losses were a little bit bigger than, um, I wanted when they, when they came, but they weren't, um, you know, throwing darts or anything. I had a stop loss set. I had a plan in place. I knew, I knew where, where I thought I could go. I just, I just didn't like the the massive swings in the hundreds of dollars each way, um, so so I then scaled it way back, and um, you know ever since uh, I guess that was a couple months you know before I really realized you know this wasn't quite right because I was struggling with uh, consistency, and then I scaled it way back, and um, I've been doing 300 share lots off the get go to start off with. Uh, and I can't, I will, depending on the plan, build up, you know, a bigger position than that. But uh, that way I can work on my consistency and, and uh, you know, focus on just, you know, making winning trades and not worrying about, you know, all of a sudden I'm going to be down, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, th- this is actually super interesting because for, for, for those of you listening, I mean, think about everything. He, he, he educated himself. He took time off. He, he uh, I, Nate, I assumed you did some paper trading too during all that time. <clears throat> Yeah, I was doing paper trading with actual pen and paper, yeah. Okay, oh, nice. Old school style, that a boy. Uh, yeah. So he, he was doing all this, and then when he finally put real money on, on the line, the only thing that screwed him up, literally the only thing was his position sizing. He went in too big, and there was just too much risk. So in his mind, he just he, he, he couldn't quite deal with it. It was throwing everything off. But think about that. One little thing like that, and that's what makes position sizing just so... Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those little kind of sneaky little things out there where you don't realize it, but you know, from a, a, people hear risk management and they think, oh, wow, risk management, that sounds complicated from a, a very fundamental and basic perspective. Just think about it. 
risk management starts with how many shares are you buying for options players? You know, how many contracts are you buying? If you're buying too many and going in too big, your mind is going to screw with you. And you may have all that education. Like Nate says, you may have a plan, you may have a stop loss, but there's still going to be something that's just a little bit off. And a lot of the time, it's just simply, well, what, how many shares are you buying? How many contracts are you buying? And if you go down to the level where you're almost like, eh, I don't even care what happens, your, your frame of mind is going to be so much better. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's super interesting how, I mean, you did everything right. Like Chez said, you took time off, but there was still that one little thing. But it's not a little thing. It's a huge thing because if you're risking too much, then your mind is just, you, you, your mental you know, framework is not going to be able to keep up with any sort of maybe plan that you have on paper. So, yeah, good point there, Nate. Now, are you, uh, let me ask you this. You, you said you wanted to build a position. So some people may be thinking, uh-oh, he's averaging down or he's averaging up. Now, what, what's the difference to you between averaging up or averaging down and just simply building a position? Yeah, um, so most of the time in that, in that account, uh, you know, I trade the, uh, I look at the two and the five minute and then kind of off to the side, I'll have, uh, you know, the daily and the 15 minute just for an overall perspective. But I'm mainly looking at the two and the five minute. And uh, when I look at the chart, I kind of plan out my trade. And let's just say, you know, and I'll have essentially what I'll think are, you know, my first spot where I would like to enter um, if the price gets there. And then what I'll have is there's usually a little bit of wiggle room where um, I would like to kind of build a bit of a little bit bigger of a position if the stock continues to go the way um, like I think it's going, but yet hasn't violated my stop loss. So I usually have I know where my stop's going to be in place, but I usually want to try to get in a little bit in case it turns around before. You know, uh, let's take an example. Just uh, I'm struggling here, but like if I'm going long on a stock, and uh, you know I'm buying a pullback, and I think it's going to start to bounce, I'll usually you know kind of set up where my first 300 shares will be, right where I think it's going to bounce. And you know, with any any stock, it's not going to literally, unless you're you know fantastic, going to hit your entry and then turn around and go right in your direction. I mean, that would be a minor miracle. And if you could do it on a daily basis, then I need to come watch what you're doing. But so anyway, and so there's a little bit of wiggle room between when my, my trade plan is still valid and when my, you know, when it's not valid. And so in that little bit of wiggle room, I'm willing to pick up some more shares just at a better price um, as long as the plan hasn't been violated, which means my stop loss has been hit. But once it goes past my stop loss, I'm out. I don't. I don't continue to, you know, average down or whatever to try to. I haven't got there yet. I don't even continue to build to try to, you know, mitigate. You know, get back into to go to loss management mode or whatever anybody else wants. I just kind of hits my stop loss. I'm out. I move on to the next trade. Yeah, and it's super important for kind of people to realize that you know Nate gives himself room to add to the position. He still has his risk and everything's set in advance, but he gives himself room because, you know, unless you're trading off of a spreadsheet and you can always, you know, in hindsight, pick the bottom or sell the top, you know, you're not, you're not going to do that. It's just not that precise. Things are going to wiggle around. There's a lot of players that are kind of involved in the market. So, so yeah, you do not average down. You kind of stick to your rules and, you know, that's, you know, probably why your success has kind of really been taken off. Um, so, so you kind of had gone through the courses now, you're now day trading. Um, so how how has that been working out for you? Uh, it's it's going fine. Um, it's going. I mean, I don't. Uh, it's. Uh, I I would love. You know, right now. Um, I just would love to get a little bit more consistent. I definitely uh, have been doing well. I've been making money. Um, like I said, I I've lowered my share size. Um, so I don't make a a huge killing on a daily basis. But like right now, I'm focusing on. Um, I try to make it, you know, I try to try to focus on having, you know, winners every day and moving on, you know, not a whole bunch of red days in a row and then one green day. Um, and so that's really been my goal since January, the new year. I, I went down to that 300, you know, share for the first group. And that has actually been working out really well. Um, it's helped me be consistent and I can kind of, you know, my losses are much smaller and I can kind of make up for those and then uh, focus on, you know, having each day, you know, being green rather than, you know, digging a huge hole and then 
you know, getting all out of whack. And I, and I do this, you know, kind of on the side, I, obviously I have a full time job, um, and I trade from work. So not every day I can, you know, trade, you know, as much as I like. So, um, it's more important for me to, when I do get a chance to do it, be kind of consistent and not have some huge, uh, massive loss, you know, for, you know, that day. Yeah, I think I, I think you're, you're it's just a good example of uh, trading as a case by case basis. I mean, from talking with you, I mean, you enjoy your job. That that's safe to say, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I would never. I mean, and that's a, like everybody. You know, their goal is to be a full time trader. My my goal is to stay full time at my current job and trade on the side. <laughs> right. So, and you made a no. You know, I don't I don't make a massive killing every day. So some people might be thinking, well, then what's the point? I mean, so you're a terrible trader if you don't make any huge wins. But think about it, Nate. He doesn't need to. He likes his job. He's just doing this uh, so, you know, he can buy me flowers and stuff like that. I mean, so he's just doing it for side money. And it's a situation where everybody's individual, you listening, I don't know your situation. Nobody else knows your situation but you. And that's why people making broad assertions such as, unless you're making a ton of money, you're not a successful trader. No, absolutely not. Maybe you do like your job and maybe you're just doing it for some supplemental income and you just want to be consistent and, you know, just create a little bit of a, a cash stream for yourself. So, uh, you know, very good point there. Well, as you've progressed, you've, I don't, let me ask this. Have you ever had any problems taking losses? Have you ever, has that been a battle for you? Cause I feel like you're super unique in a lot of different ways here. Yeah. Uh, no, I, taking losses don't seem to bother me. I mean, I guess and maybe I've been lucky cause like, uh, you know, I haven't had any like you know, really huge, I guess, cause I, I, you know, I watched the RVR, you know, training videos that you offer and, it, and it, you know, pretty much lays out like I, you know, and that's why I think it was key that I didn't start this day trading account till I was done all of those videos that, you know, I had the plans in place. I knew this, why the stop losses were there and I've just always honored them. I guess one day, one day I remember, um, talking to you, Clay in the chat room and, uh, and you told me, uh, you know, I kind of was like, ah, I think I got cheap shotted, you know, one day and you were like, yeah, cheap shots happen, you know, where it like kind of went down and hit my stop loss, like on the nose and then turned around and did exactly what I thought it was going to do. And so like, you were like, Hey, you know, try using a mental stop loss, try using a mental stop loss. So then like, I remember the next day I tried the whole mental thing and, uh, it went through my stop loss and, uh, it kind of kept going on me and I, you know, mentally I knew I wanted to get out and I'm fumbling around with the order thing. And like, you know, I finally just get all out, like, you know, kind of like in a, you know, panic and that was probably right at the bottom, you know? <laughs> and like, ever since then I was like, Oh, screw the mental thing. I'm not there yet. Like, you know, I'm inputting the stop loss. If the supercomputer wants to go find my 300 share stop loss, then, you know, so be it. I'm going to live and die with the, the one that's built in. And, and ever since then I've never done a mental stop loss. So <laughs> what? Okay. But I'm curious, like when you were first getting started, I mean, w was losses because you mentioned, okay, you took RVR course, so that made it easier. But before that, I mean, did you ever struggle with the concept of having to tell yourself, Hey, Hey, Nate, I'm wrong. I got to take a loss. Or was that just no. not a struggle really ever? Yeah, no, I guess, I guess the only time I can, I mean, it hasn't been a struggle since I've been in the, um, in the technical world, but like it was a struggle when I was in the fundamental, you know, back in the day kind of trading. Cause I remember like, uh, back when that big crash happened in the, you know, the financial crash, what, 2008 or something, I had, I had a decent, um, size position in, uh, Chesapeake energy, which, uh, you know, then absolutely tanked. I mean, it went down and I remember back then I was like, you know, this position is so underwater. This is, I'm, I'm never getting this back. And so, you know, being the, um, you know, gambler that I am, what did I do? I doubled down. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to buy twice as many shares down here. And so I doubled down and, uh, it actually worked out for me. It then, you know, Chesapeake energy ended up bouncing. Like, I think I got it like the low, it was like maybe 15 bucks when I decided to double down and I had bought like a whole bunch of my beginning like up in the 40s or something so it got back to like $30 and I was in the green and I was like screw you and by that time you know like uh like the CEO had been like you know fired for like selling like just dumping shares on the market it was a total mess but so like back then I would take I would have huge losses and just kind of ride them out so I think I had when the technical stuff kind of came in I had already learned like 
you know, don't let it get out. I've already seen stuff get out of control, and um, I just knew not to let it get out of control. Huge, huge point right there, guys, is that while he may have averaged down in the beginning, he recognized that he got lucky and it bounced. And, you know, that was a whole kind of crazy time during the financial collapse and stuff. But the important part is, is he recognized it and it's not a part of his daily strategy. So, you know, those of you who watch the the kind of the average down video that Clay has on YouTube, make sure you get all the way through the video because we've had some people who haven't and thought that it was a viable strategy and it's not. You'll get wiped out pretty quickly if you take kind of one bad turn. So, Bump, so bumping it, bumping it is a viable strategy <laughs> for some people. But if you I have a not b- bazillion it. dollars, yes, <laughs> or if you have a spreadsheet, yeah, yeah or if you have a also spreadsheet. true. Yeah, <laughs> spreadsheet trading is the best kind of trading, though. You're never wrong. You know, I, I I'm I'm a big fan of HindsightTrader.com. They're a really good broker. And I'm totally stealing this from, I think, Hooch in the chat room. But he posted a link to, like, hindsighttrader.com. And it just had me cracking up because it's, it's so true. Like, aren't we all just fantastic traders in hindsight and on yeah. spreadsheets and stuff? It's, it's amazing. But, Chez, I think you had a question that I rudely cut you off from. That's okay. It's your podcast. I'll allow it this time. But, um, yeah, so, so Nate, what, uh, what type of strategy are you kind of currently using? You know, do you have any favorite indicators or, you know, what I – know, I know you're a short-term trader – um, just based on you know having a full time work schedule, but uh, you know how what what what's kind of your your bread and butter for trading? All right, and I so, got to be ru- I got to be rude again, just because I, I I wanted to note this, but Nate is my boy. I love Nate in the sense of I feel like I'm kind of staring in the mirror with his trading strategy because I we're we're pretty much you know there's there's no right or wrong way to trade, but sometimes people you know you just you just trade the same way, and Nate and I we trade pretty much the same setups. Uh, we like the same stuff. So in the chat room, I always have a little bit extra, or I'm always looking a little bit closer for Nate's alerts, just because I've learned over time we we trade very similarly. So uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not proclaiming Nate and I have the the proper way to trade. I'm not saying that, but apparently our mental mind frame is kind of made up the same. That scares me, Nate, uh, to yeah. see how you conduct yourself. So I'm a little scared that our minds apparently work a little alike. I'm nervous. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, and just to explain that, I, I would say, you know, from a macro sense, I always lean towards the shorting side, which is, you know, I struggle then when I ever try to go long because I'm always, I'm always thinking short first and, and long never. But I eventually I do, I do kind of find myself in those trades. But like my favorite setup is uh, first thing in the morning, 930 rings, and we, we get those gap downs, and then you get a dead cat bounce. And like, I have a, uh, a scanner set up from Trade Ideas that is like, I built it just to like search for those. And it's like, um, you know, it gives me everybody, you know, who's gapped down and is bouncing and, and how much, you know, they're, they've bounced in the last either two or five minutes. And so like I literally just sit there and, and cycle through charts of those and literally just look for those, those short, those, those bounces all morning long. And that's, and then that's one thing I struggled with. It's funny because uh, that that scanner works great from like you know nine thirty to ten thirty eleven in the clock max. And then if you look at the scanner after that, it really is like an indicator for like playing like you know a long bottom play because otherwise it, they're not short short term you know short the dead cat bounce at all anymore. Um, so I. And that's that's what works great with my my job is like I can trade you know from nine thirty to to ten thirty or eleven o'clock and then go do my regular work. So that's my that's my one setup is is that gap down dead cat bounce play is is my number one go to. And of course, you're looking at volume primarily too, right? You need yeah. to have some liquidity in there. Yeah. So I look at mainly uh, yeah just just price action and volume those those two and uh i will say when i when i have tried to trade later in the day um you know when i get into a little bit of like the trend trading i'll use like uh the macd um is the only other thing i'll use uh moving averages in the macd and i'll try to you know hit up a little bit longer of a um, time frame but i haven't really mastered that yet i admit i'm i'm more into those you know morning volatility short plays. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, I want you to quickly touch on this. Uh, it actually happened yesterday for you in Facebook, but just it, it's such a, a prime example. And I know I had you posting images to keep us updated, but you had those, what, you started at 300 shares, right, of Facebook? Uh, 
It, we were. I was in Apple. Yeah, I was in Apple. And oh, I was, Apple. Yeah, Apple. Yeah, yeah. But and I was buying that. I bought a the pullback uh, right around, and it was like uh, right around eleven o'clock, like ten forty five, eleven o'clock. And um, yeah, I, I initially started out with like uh, I had four hundred shares. I bought uh, two two groups of two hundred. Um, you know, right in like uh, what where what was the price? Uh, One twenty nine something, wasn't it? Oh yeah, so I was at yeah. My first group, my my first two hundred was at one twenty nine oh one. I slick willied the round number, and then it actually broke through it on me. But I knew I was willing to 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 uh, you know build up a little bit bigger of position until it got down to like if it had broke one um one twenty eight seventy five, like my stop loss was below there. So I think I picked up two hundred more at like uh, one twenty eight eighty six. 86 I think that's right. Yeah, 12886 or one Yeah, 12886. And so um and then I so then, you know, managing the trade at first, you know, I always look at the 2 minute and I kind of fake, you know, tr- I I obviously sell and I was long, so I was uncomfortable. So I obviously sold the first 200 shares, you know, real quick. I think I made like uh you know, 25 bucks each cuz yeah, what was my my like closed P&L was like 59.50. Yeah, yeah, I think it was fifty nine bucks. Fifty nine yep. bucks. So I closed two hundred real quick. You know, it, it when it bounced a little bit for me, and um, yeah, I'm working on being you know managing those other shares, letting them work for me. So um, I then went into I split them up into two one hundred share lots and put one like uh, just under you know like I decided to use the five minute um, a moving average on the five minute chart and the other one I. I uh I was even looking at like the 15 just to try to you know I thought it was going to bounce so just to try to keep them a little longer and I ended up what holding 100 shares all the way until like 3:30 in the afternoon and I even was getting nervous cuz like I don't want to hold them overnight and it finally closed them out when it like I switched over to like the 2 minute chart I was like screw it if it if it breaks the the moving average on the 2 minute chart I'm out because I didn't want to hold them overnight and I made what like 115 bucks on those last 100 shares and i made 5950 on all the other ones combined yeah so that's that's a critical critical example of as traders maybe you've heard people say you know you got to let your position work for you i mean think about what Nate just said you had 400 shares 300 of those shares netted them $59 but those final 100 shares netted them a total of 110 because he just sat back and let it work for him so Uh, A a critical and a very real example, like I said, I had him posting screenshots and stuff in the chat room just because it's it's a concept where if you want to have any sort of long-term success, when you get a winner, you have to let the winner work for you. Well, I know Chez has some final uh, questions here for you. So Chez, take it away, my friend. I do. So it's uh, not specifically trading related, but um, if I were to lend you my time machine, which I have in, you know, my storage unit, uh, what would you, you know, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would that advice be? Uh, one, one piece of advice. Um, I guess, I, yeah, my one piece of advice, I would go back to that 2005 time when I was uh, learning about the stock market. I'd tell myself, don't waste your time with this fundamental crap. Just learn the technical side. It's much less stressful, and I'm yeah. sure it saves you a ton of time, too, just kind of looking at it technically. So. Yeah, that's a pretty good piece of advice right there. Now, you know, what uh what, what would you say are your strengths and kind of your weaknesses and you know, how does that kind of play into your trading? I think uh my strengths are that I guess uh, one I'm extremely focused that uh you know, I I've set my mind up that I'm going to learn how to do this and I'm going to um, you know, I'll study and I'll work my ass off until uh I get it right. So that that's one of my strengths, I would say, and I guess uh that being, you know, in addition to that, another strength is that like I, I stick to the plan. I'm not a I'm not a person that kind of finagles like oh yeah my stop loss was gonna be here but I think it's gonna bounce so I'm gonna just move it down a little bit more a little bit more. So I I stick I make the plan and I stick to the plan. Um, so those are my biggest strength. My biggest weakness is um, I th- I I tend to be a little bit too uh, trigger happy that. As soon as I get green, I start I start you know peeling off uh, profits, even though and I don't don't let my my winners work for me as much as I should, and that's what I kind of that's why like we had that 
I had that 100 shares all day yesterday. I'm really focusing on when I get in a winning trade, you know, make sure you let your winners work for you. Don't bail out all of them as, you know, as soon as you're green. So that's, that's my biggest weakness right now is just kind of taking profits too quickly. No, that's, that, that's awesome. And then, uh, I, I like how you said you, you, you made the commitment that you're focused, you understand, you know, this isn't a, a game of run, rainbows and butterflies. You got to work hard and, uh, there's going to be some hiccups along the way, but you just got to accept that going in and then kind of roll with those punches. Well, it's time for some final fun questions and I'm a little scared to venture into this territory with you. I don't know where this is going to go, but let's, uh, let's see what happens. So what is your favorite movie? I, I knew the whole movie was going to come up, and since and I, I am a big Dumb and Dumber fan, but you've kind of stole that one for the podcast. Well, let, I want you to walk up. the walk. I want you to walk the walk. Give me a quote from it right now. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, I gotta, I gotta think of a good one. I gotta think of a good one. I don't want to just say one of the ones everybody would know. Um, just go, man. Just go. I you know, I can't even piggyback off that one because that was just when they're riding the motorcycle through the Rocky Mountains. But that's right. And he well falls done. And then and then, I, I give you one. I'll give you one to piggyback on. There. All right, let's just, go. Okay, so I'll even give you the time frame. That you just get off of the scooter and he goes, "I'm kind of hungry." Mm, I'm not very hungry. I just swallowed a big June bug. There you go. You got it. <laughs> See, I know the movie, man. You can't stump me when it comes to Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> but well played. Well played. All right, Chez, you better take over. Else, Nate and I are going to rehearse the entire Dumb and Dumber <laughs> movie. Yeah, we'll save that for the next podcast where it's yeah, just Clay and Nate going over Dumb and Dumber. All right, so Nate, what's, uh, what's your favorite meal? Uh, I'm a big uh, steak and potato kind of guy. So you get me a really, really good steak and uh if i'm at home i'll do it on the grill and uh you know some mashed potatoes maybe a little green vegetable if my mom makes me eat it but uh, other than that steak and potatoes can't beat it nice and and you wash it down with what what kind of dessert um i dessert i'm i'm not a huge dessert guy but if i do get suckered into dessert it's either uh cheesecake or creme brulee oh fancy fancy now besides britney spears what what's your favorite song or 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 band uh yeah, so I, I don't know if I have like a just an individual, but my wife is big into like uh, um, old school rock. So she's uh, she's got like our house, you know, set up with all all the vinyl players, and she's big into vinyls. And we go to a lot of um, music festivals in the summer. We have a 1972 uh, vintage Airstream that we go pow nice. wow pow wow around in. So. Um, I'm big into the old rock, like Neil Young, you know, all that kind of stuff, the old school, Leonard Skinner, those kind of guys. Now, if you had a choice of uh, kind of an exotic place or, you know, just where, where would you want to go visit someday? Um, well, I would like to go uh, <laughs> to Bora Bora and stay in one of those uh, huts that are over top of the water on like the tropical island, you know, with like the glass floors um, where you can see the fish like from the bed, you know, have a nice romantic uh tropical vacation out there where like i never wear any clothes and you know sunbathe on my porch or whatever <laughs> that, that sounds like what i do every day at the office so I yeah mean, well sounds... <laughs> i don't there's not that much sun in in michigan right <laughs> oh we got all kinds of sun it, it may be a little bit cold out there with the sun but we got it, it's not quite a what are you talking about? You're in Baltimore. You're talking <laughs> trash about Michigan. You're in Baltimore. What kind of sun do you have? That's true. Yes. We have coastal sun. We have coastal sun. <laughs> we have coastal sun, too, from Lake Michigan. Uh, that's not the coast. <laughs> have you ever been to Lake, Lake Michigan? <laughs> no, I actually haven't. So I do have, I'll come visit you. Yeah, you'll, um, you'll, you may re- rethink that thing about not being the coast. But uh, if you can meet one person, dead or alive, who would you want to meet? Uh, okay, and I ha- I have met him once in my life, but I would like to spend a little more time with him. But my uh, childhood hero, Cal Ripken Jr. Now, besides trading, I know you work a full time job and kind of do trading with that as well. What do you kind of do for fun uh, as far as hobbies and stuff? Um, so I personally am a big sports fan. Uh, my two favorites are uh, football and baseball. So I attend a lot of, uh, sporting events in my spare time. And, uh, like I said, in the summer months, my wife has, uh, a big love for music festivals. So I, um, I support that passion of hers. And so I end up finding myself at a lot of music concerts and music festivals with her and then sporting events for myself. 
Now, are those just festivals where you're sitting on top of her shoulders and just yeah. kind of, you know, got your lighter out and stuff like that? Or Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's close. Yeah. I, I usually, I only really try to get on top of other guy's shoulders. I don't get on her shoulders because I don't want to hurt her. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's the whole, like, uh, shooting match, you know. You live live out of the uh, Airstream for a weekend and, yeah, you stumble around and everyone's, you know, having a good time. And I don't know if people put their lighters in the air. Don't they have, like... <laughs> fake lighters on their cell phones that they wave now i don't, I don't know. know i've never been to a music festival that's why i'm asking i i'm just yeah clay also has a flip phone so he doesn't know what i'm talking about with the caps, <laughs> with, with uh with lighters on them anyway yeah I'm, I'm i'm apparently a little bit behind on that but i just don't have much experience at britney spears concerts like you so uh but anyway so final question here and it's the one we always want like to end with uh three words you know how would you define a successful trader in terms of three words? My first word would be focused. Uh, my second word would be disciplined. And my third word would be smart. Well, then that rules me out because I'm, uh, I'm definitely not the smartest, but um, very smart, good, very good. Smart. Everybody has their own definition of smart, Chez. This is very true. I'm, I'm special. My mom told me I'm special, so that's what counts. But, that's uh, right. So it's to been her, an absolute, uh, absolute pleasure having you on, Nate. It was a really fun podcast. Now, where can our listeners find you, either on Twitter or Facebook or just kind of in the chat room? Yeah, I mean, they can find me in Baltimore. That's usually where I hang out most of the time. But um, if, if you want to try to get a hold of me other places, um, yeah, I'm in the Inner Circle chat room. Um, and uh, I am on Twitter, and, uh, but, you know, not a whole heck of a lot. But uh, I think it's like Nate Wilson 2 or something like that on there. Uh, but you know, if you know, the cool people know where to find me. So that means that nobody knows where to find you, huh? Cause I don't think anybody can live up to your coolness levels. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm happy to give everybody my cell phone number. You could just text or call me. That's, that's the best way to get a hold of me or fly to Baltimore. Yeah. Or fly to Baltimore and then we'll definitely have a good time. Nice. Nice. Well, Hey man, I, I had a good time and I promise that's just not lip service. This was a, a fun time. So thanks for taking time out of your day. I can see the sunny sky behind you, so appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. I, it, was, it was a blast. We'll do it again sometime. All right. So if you enjoyed today's podcast, and hopefully you did, uh, I'd like to make a few requests. First, if you wouldn't mind, if you're listening to this on the site, click one of those share buttons or leave a comment below. Uh, we will gladly interact with you. We will gladly answer any questions. Uh, and if you have anything for Nate, leave those questions down in the comment section. And uh, I'm sure he will take some time out to answer anything you may have. If you're listening to this on iTunes, uh, please leave a review. Give us some feedback. We want to make this uh, the best possible podcast. So we're totally open to suggestions. So if you were to leave a review, that would be uh, very much appreciated. So thank you for hanging out with us today. And get out there and trade without emotion. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.